Welcome, everyone, to this time of worship at Wallace Presbyterian Church. It is certainly good to see everyone on this beautiful Sunday morning and the fourth Sunday in Lent. I want to welcome everyone, um, and I want to welcome you if you happen to be a visitor this morning. If you are visiting with us for the first time or second or third or fourth time, we want to welcome you to this church, and we hope that you will consider if you are looking for a church home, a church family, that this will be the place for you, and we welcome you over and over again. I want to call your attention to the announcements in the bulletin. There's a lot going on in the life of our congregation. Certainly be aware of what is going on and find your place to make a difference and to be involved. We encourage everyone to do that. Phil, of course, is not with us. He is Hopefully, along with our, our confirmation class, not waterlogged out at uh, Camp Kirkwood, Danielle and I were out there. Oh, they're on their way back. So waterlogged or not, they're coming back. So that is, uh, I tell you, I want to take a moment um, because my daughter, of course, is, is a member of the confirmation class to express my thanks to this, this congregation, to the session. Uh, to everyone that has supported uh, this group of, of, of young people as they seek to take the next step in their relationship with God and Jesus Christ and become members of this, this church. Um, it's a wonderful thing, and this is a terrific group, uh, and I think they had a wonderful time, rain or not. So, I have got an announcement um, that I think many of you know, but I'm going to announce it anyway. We want to be welcoming the newest member of Wallace Presbyterian Church, Harriet Blake Farrier, who is the daughter of Nate and Georgia Farrier. She was born March 12th at 1049, and she was eight pounds, five ounces, and 19 inches long, and is going to go by the name Hattie B. So we want to welcome Hattie B to this family of faith, and we congratulate and, and have joyful prayers with and for Nate and Georgia and for Charlie and Harriet and all of the Farrier family. This is wonderful news. I, let me ask, is there a minute for mission? Did anybody sign up for that? Because I asked a couple of folks and was not aware of one. If we don't, then we will move forward. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds then for the worship of Almighty God. Please join us for the call to worship. Please join me in reading responsively our opening sentences. Lift up your voice and call out to God. We cry out, believing that God hears us. Come together and wait for God. We come together, trusting that God is still speaking. Surely God's presence is here with us now. Come, worship the Lord. We celebrate the power of God that restores us. Our opening hymn is number 697, Take My Life, and we will sing verses 1 through 3 as our opening hymn, and the rest of it as our closing hymn.
Let us now enter into a season of confession, praying together the prayer of confession as it is printed in the bulletin. We pray, Holy God, in the light of your holiness, we see ourselves as we really are, and we are ashamed. We confess that we are people with impure thoughts and unclean lips. We think too highly of ourselves and too little of others. We cling so tightly to the treasures of this world that we cannot open our hands to receive blessings from above. Our feet follow the paths of sin. We wander so far astray that we become strangers to righteousness. Forgive us and set us again on the path that leads to life. Deal with us not as we deserve, but according to your mercy. Not because we are worthy, but because you are gracious. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, let us read responsibly the assurance of pardon. While it is true that we have sinned, it is a greater truth that through God's love in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. God has shown his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for us. By his wounds, we have been healed. seated. Let me ask for any of our young folks that we have to come forward at this time for the children's sermon. If we have any. We have one. How are you guys this morning? Good, I hope. I ask you guys something. We're in the time of Lent, and the time of Lent leads us to what? To Easter, right? Easter is the time when we know that Jesus died on the cross for us, but then he was raised again to save us from our sins, right? Well, in keeping with that, I'm going to show you guys, I wrote down some things. All of us sometimes do things that maybe we are things we shouldn't, aren't supposed to do. Um, you know, we might call them sin, we might call them mistakes, we might call them whatever, but everybody, big people and little people alike, do things that are always not the exact right thing to do. And what I have done is, and I wrote a bunch of these down, so only two of you, this will be easy. I'm just going to read some things that, that young folks about your age maybe might do from time to time. Maybe not, but maybe, maybe might do from time to time. Um, taking things that are not mine, disobeying my parents, my mom, and my dad, arguing with my brother or my sister, being dishonest, wishing that I had other people's things, mistreating other people, saying unkind things about others, not sharing, only thinking about myself, and not putting God first. Now, you guys may not do all or any of those things, but the point is everybody makes mistakes from time to time, no matter how big or small you are, we make mistakes. And the older you get, you might have a different list of things that you regret doing or maybe do that don't please God. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. What happens at Easter? You know what happens at Easter? At Easter, 
I brought a real sophisticated prop this morning. <laughs> I'm going to hand both of you guys a couple of these things. These are the sins or the things that maybe we shouldn't do, and I'm going to hand them to you, and I'm going to hand you a couple as well. And here's what I, I want you to do. At Easter, God says, here's what I'm going to do. I love you so much that no matter what you do, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're going to do, I love you. And so, rip those things up. Can you do that? Can you just tear them? And I want you to throw them in this trash can right here. Just rip them up. I'm going to rip the rest of them up. Rip them up. Tear them up. Good. Wad them up. And throw them in the trash can. Can you do that? That is what God does for us. He said, I love you so much, so much, that even though you may do things from time to time that are not always the right thing to do, I'm going to forget that. And I sent Jesus to show you how to live your life and to try to be better. And that's the message that we are going to talk about in just a few minutes in the Big People Sermon about Lent. Because God has loved us so much, what we need to do is we need to think about how we can look at ourselves as we look toward Easter and we are thankful for all the things that, that God has done for us. We need to think about how we might change and how we might do things that honor God and things that follow Jesus Christ. So that's what I wanted to say to you guys this morning. Is that all right? Can we have a prayer? Can we do that? Let's pray together. Gracious, merciful God, we, we thank you that you love us so much, big folks and little folks alike. You are a gracious and loving God. We give thanks to you. We give thanks to you for the young people of this church. We ask for your mighty hand to guide them, be with them. Help us all to be followers of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And it is in his name that we pray to you. Amen.
Let us, as we prepare to hear God's word, pray together our prayer for illumination. We pray, eternal God, through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world. Help us now to hear your word and give us grace to respond in faithful obedience that our lives might be signs of the new life given through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is taken from the prophet Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 31 through 34. If you choose to read along, it is on page 642 in your pew Bible. I invite you to listen for the word of God. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Our next hymn is number 840, It Is Well With My Soul.
Our New Testament scripture passage is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Again, I invite you to listen to God's word to and for us this morning. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us, one body, just as, just as each of us has one body with many members, and those members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we are many from one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the fourth Sunday in Lent, and I thought it would be appropriate to stay with the Lenten theme, if, it, if you want to call it a theme. So for a few minutes this morning, I would like for us to think of Lent again, this time leading us to Easter, but first to the cross in a different light. Not just to think of Lent as a time to give up something temporarily, which we so often hear, or to simply view it as the time preceding Easter or leading up to Easter, but as a time to look at our lives and a time to make a change. What if we were to look at Lent as a time to claim a new way of being in relationship with God by the way we have transformed something significant in our lives. And that's the word that I want us to focus on. It is the title of the sermon, transformed. How are we transformed during this time leading to Easter, leading us to resurrection, but yes, first to the cross? Do we ever stop to feel the power friends, of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ? Have we ever stopped to feel the anticipation of what is in front of us in the dark despair of the cross and then the hope that follows in Easter? Not just think about it, not just study it, not just intellectualize it, but feel the power, a power that transforms. In the Lenten season, we're heading toward the dark despair of death and crucifixion. The cross is there. What does the cross represent to you? Not the cross yet that symbolizes resurrection and new life. We're not there yet. Alone, the cross stands for something that's more ominous, but it's familiar to all of us in some way, how does it make you feel? In this Lenten season, we're also headed, of course, toward Easter morning, a time of resurrection, now a time of hope, of new life, of new life. How does that make you feel? 
Sometimes it's difficult to feel what we are leading to in Easter during our Lenten journey. We're so familiar with Lent and the crucifixion and Christ's resurrection that it, it's almost difficult for us to hear the story as something new and wonderful and to remain captivated by the mystery of it all. The poet W.S. Handley Jones expressed this well. He wrote, Too well, O Christ, we know thee. On our eyes there sits a film through which we dimly see of frozen faith and stagnant memory. Thou art among us in the homely guise of one whose nearness like a shadow lies between our minds and his own mystery. And our familiar knowledge is to thee a second tomb from which thou dost not rise. We should hope that during this season of Lent leading to Easter, that the good news that awaits us does not get changed over to stale and old news. We need, don't we, to feel, feel the power of what God has done. A power that transforms. Do we still have a sense of awe? Do we still have a sense of fear when we think about resurrection life? I mean, after all, shouldn't the resurrection shake us up a little bit? Shouldn't it evoke in us a sense of, of holy awe, of holy fear? If Jesus of Nazareth was raised from the dead, the whole world and everything in it has been turned upside down. So if that news, if the resurrection doesn't shake us up a little bit, maybe frighten us a little bit, maybe we've never truly felt it. And as we look toward Easter and we look toward hope, toward hope, how does that make us feel? In biblical times and now, it feels like unadulterated, overflowing joy. The Bible says, so they left the tomb quickly with great fear and joy when they found it empty. The gospel accounts of the resurrection agree it caused overwhelming joy to flood the souls of the disciples. And it should evoke great joy in us too, even as we look forward to it from where we are now in Lent. When Christ emerged victorious from the tomb, human hope emerged as well. Good is more powerful than evil. Love is more powerful than hate. It has been said that the stone is rolled away from the tombs in which our better selves have too long been buried. How about that? It is a joy, a joy that transforms. So how else, how else do we feel here in Lent? Looking toward Easter. It's not particularly comfortable, but I would ask you to think for a moment, like I did with the, the kids just a few minutes ago. Think about your own sin. Now think about having to atone for the guilt of your own sin. Shouldn't we feel this overwhelming gratitude to God for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. The great reformer Martin Luther was said to have had a dream. And in that dream, an angel wrote out all of Luther's sins on a huge white tablet. And the list was so long that it covered the front and the back of the tablet. But then appearing out of nowhere in the dream came this pierced hand. And the pierced hand wrote on the tablet above Luther's name, the blood of Jesus cleanses your sin. And then the blood from the pierced hand flowed down the tablet and washed it clean. Our greatest need and God's greatest achievement are one and the same, and that is forgiveness. How does that make you feel? Does that not evoke in you a great gratitude to God? A gratitude 
that transforms. So, if what we are preparing for at Easter makes us feel these powerful emotions, holy fear, great joy, gratitude, along with the work of the Holy Spirit, should we not be transformed? Should our lives not be changed by this power? Transformation, there's that word once again. How are we transformed? Certainly there are many ways that each one of us might lead a transformed life or might seek to transform certain parts of our lives, but I want to focus on one that is important for all Christians. Perhaps one way of being transformed is to listen for our calling in Jesus Christ. We're all called in some way to serve God, to serve Christ, to serve the church. We're all called as disciples. And if we're familiar with Jesus' life and, and Jesus' ministry in the scriptures, then you know that Jesus calls us, all of us, first and foremost to follow him. The Greek verb that means to follow is used some 80 times in the Gospels, and it's used by Jesus himself. He bids us to follow him. He's our leader, our friend, our commander. He is the one who's gone out before us, and we are called to follow in his steps. So it would seem that our first and our most important calling in the way that we might transform is to follow the one whose name that we bear, and that's the name Christian. I ask you to think about these two questions. The first one is, do you believe in Jesus Christ? The second one is, are you following Jesus Christ? We hear the first question asked all the time, but the second one is far more telling. To believe in Jesus doesn't require very much of me, but to follow Jesus requires a lot. And it might even require me picking up my own cross, just like Jesus said. We say we believe in Jesus, but perhaps even more critical is whether we believe with Jesus and like Jesus. Time and again, <clears throat> we read in the Bible that Jesus captures the life and the loyalty of people with this invitation, the invitation to come and to follow him. To Peter and Andrew fishing, he says, follow me, I will make you fish for people. He says two words to Matthew, the tax collector, follow me. Jesus told Peter, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. When people came up with convenient excuses for not joining Jesus, he still said, follow me. He said to the young rich man acquiring about eternal life, sell all that you own, distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And this invitation to follow Jesus is for all of us today as well. It's personal. It's penetrating. It goes right to the heart of the matter. It cuts through all theology. It cuts through all of the rhetoric. Are we followers of Jesus Christ? Or are we just believers in him? Maybe we're, we're reluctant to actually follow Jesus. Afraid that we don't, we don't measure up in some way. We're afraid that it might cost us a little bit too much if we decide to follow. The original followers of Jesus, we're told, were apprehensive too. They didn't, they didn't know where Jesus was leading them. They didn't always agree with him or approve of his tactics. They were confused by him at times. Jesus questioned many of their values and he questioned their customs, but they followed him all the way to the cross. And Jesus will challenge us too. It's a radical thing to follow Jesus Christ as an individual a radical thing, really, to follow Jesus as a church. It's radical in the sense that it, it goes right to the root of who and what we are. And when we say yes to the invitation to follow Jesus, then we declare this and we say this, Lord Jesus, no matter where it is, when it is, how it is, I'll try to follow in your steps. I'll try to be what you want me to be. And I'll try to do 
what you want me to do, but I need your help. And I need your grace because on my own, I will fail. Transformation. Many of us, I suspect, are often preoccupied, I am, with the question of what to do with our lives, how to make God's world better, how to contribute our time, our talent, our energy to Christ's church. How can I make a difference? But I think the question for us, particularly at this time of Lent, as we look at ourselves, is are we ready and willing to seek Jesus out? Because it's easy to become comfortable in our faith. It's easy to think we've got everything we need already. It's, it's easy to start just going through the motions instead of actively seeking Jesus and then actively following Jesus. There's a story that you might have heard before about a terrible storm that came into a town and local officials sent word that the river would overflow and flood the homes in the surrounding area. And many people evacuated. But one faithful Christian man decided to wait out the storm in his home. And he said to himself, I will trust God. And if I'm in danger, he will send a divine miracle to save me. And so the waters began to rise and they reached his doorstep. A neighbor paddled by in a canoe and called to the man to get in with him and paddle to safety. But the man declined. He said, I have faith that God will save me. The flood waters rose higher and higher, finally pouring into his living room, and he had to retreat to the second floor of his house. A police motorboat came by and saw the man, and they said that they would come up and, and rescue him. But the man waved them off saying they should use their time to save others. He said, I have faith that God will save me. And the floodwaters rose higher and higher, and the man had to climb up to his rooftop. And a rescue helicopter spotted him and dropped down a ladder to him, and a rescue officer climbed down the ladder and reached out to the trapped man saying, grab my hand, I'll pull you up. But the man refused to reach out. And once again, he said, no, thank you. God will save me. Afterward, the house broke apart. The man was swept away in the waters and he drowned. And then once in heaven, he stood before God and he said, I put all my faith in you. All of my faith. Why didn't you come and save me? And God said, son, I sent you a canoe, a boat, and a helicopter. Why did you not go? What were you looking for? If we're going to find Jesus, we've got to be willing to go out and find him. And for some of us, it might mean going on a retreat. For many of us, it might be something as small as adding Sunday school to our Sunday morning routine. Maybe serving the church in some small way that is new to you. But whatever it is, we need to see that it's not just about what we do and how we find meaning, but how we fit into the work that God is already doing all around us. Or maybe we think we found Jesus already. There's no need to seek him anymore. More than 5,000 people had to leave their towns, their homes, in order to find Jesus. So we're told in Scripture, they had to leave in order to be fed, to find a miracle. That could be waiting for us too. But we have to seek and we have to follow. And we might have to change. Friends, may... This season of Lent be a time for you to truly feel what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And may it also be a time for you, for all of us, as we, as we look to the cross, as we anticipate the joy of Easter morning, may we listen for God's call to us and, and may we experience joy. May we experience the anticipation 
as we see the cross change from this, this symbol of death to a symbol of new life, a symbol of hope. And in all of that, may we find that part of our own lives that can truly be transformed. Amen. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Gracious and almighty God, we, we gather this morning as your children to worship you and praise you and thank you. We praise your holy name. You are a great God and you are greatly to be praised. We thank you, almighty God, for every blessing we receive, for every good thing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Lenten season, this time leading us to Easter, a time of hope, of joy. We pray that you would allow this to be a time of transformation for us. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ into the world to be our model for living, to atone for our sin. We thank you that in Jesus Christ's perfect meekness and his sacrifice on the cross that the world was forever changed and that our greatest need was indeed met by your great work. We thank you, O oh God, that we can live with great hope now. We pray that you will help us to live now loving others as you love us, forgiving as you have forgiven Equip us to spread the good news of the gospel, to reach out to other people in love. Oh Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would cleanse us and refresh us and breathe into us a new life, that you would show us the deeper meaning of our existence here. And with that new life that you give, let us then have the courage to take up our own crosses to follow Jesus Christ by walking humbly and by serving. Almighty God, we pray this morning for your world and for your people. We pray for those everywhere who suffer, those who are in danger or those who are hungry, helpless, or afraid. We pray for those who do not have the basic needs of their life met. We ask you to bless them, to be and abide with them. Gracious God, we pray for the members of this community of faith, our church family. We pray for friends, for family members. We lift up to you those who are sick and those who have other particular needs. We put everything before you. We trust in you, for we do know that you are the God who hears prayers and the God who sustains and heals, and we thank you for that. Oh, Lord, we ask now that you would hear us as we use the words and pray together, the, one, the words of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship of God now with the presentation of our tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Merciful and almighty God, we offer a small portion of the gifts that we have received back to you this morning. We pray that this offering will be used for good in your world. We pray that it will be used to help others to spread the good news of the gospel. In Christ's name we ask and pray this. Amen. Let us now affirm what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is once again number 697, Take My Life, verses 4 through 6. Let us go out into God's world. Let us know who and whose we are. And let us lead lives that are truly transformed. May the Lord bless and keep all of us, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.